Hello, it's good to see everybody today. Um, my name is Jens. I've been involved with open source driver development for a little over 20 years now. And uh, I'm really excited to see all the progress that the community's made and see everybody here together today. Also with me today is... Hi, um, I'm Pierre Lou. Um, I've worked on the Linux driver stack at NVIDIA for a little bit over five years. And uh, more recently has been uh, working on uh, Linux software and strategy for Valve for uh, a little bit over five years as well. Just in case you forget what we look like. So what we really want to talk about today is, is the benefits of open source 3D driver development to game developers, and ultimately the benefits that ripple from that through to gamers themselves and the experience. Um, it's really, getting to an interesting point right now. Um, scale is kind of becoming a real challenge and opportunity for open source drivers specifically in that uh, the largest, the most well-funded driver support teams in the industry, they still can't address all the needs of the AAA developers and this long tail of indie developers. Um, and we believe that an open approach enables this DIY approach that can scale to meet this challenge. Um, but we also need to get a good understanding as a community of what, the, what it'll take, the practices it'll take in order to scale up to multiple GPU architectures supporting thousands of titles across multiple platforms. This is, this is something that hasn't been done before and, and this is uh, the challenge in front of us that we want to talk about today. Um, so, you know, over, over the years, uh, working on drivers and being, uh, you know, working as a game developer, uh, as a consumer of drivers, working closely with vendor drivers, uh, also with open source community drivers, and more recently, you know, being a little bit of a, a platform uh, vendor ourselves, like providing a distro and trying to, uh, you know, have good driver support for it. Um, we uh, have a little bit of perspective on, on dealing with um, you know, drivers and, and uh, trade-offs between uh, open and closed drivers. So I, I just, uh, we thought it would be useful to kind of share some uh, tidbits of our perspective on, uh, on all that. Um, and what we've been observing is that we think that the benefits for open drivers really outweigh the trade-off, like, the, it seemed, the, the trade-off seems worth it, I guess is uh, what I, what the summary of, uh, of this. And so to kind of go over that, um, I wanted to kind of uh, first go over the, the perceived benefits from uh, app and game developer side, um, but also kind of turn them around, because at, at this point I think these are pretty well known. So I want to turn it around a little bit and talk about the second order side effects of, of these benefits and how, um, how they actually are or might be more impactful than we think. And you know, all that is my own perspective. It might not be factual, uh, but I, I think that we you know, we, we aggregated a lot of good data over the years. Um, then some considerations from, you know, a, a platform vendor's point of view. And of course, you know, our platform's pretty young and, and uh, is not the most popular out there. So take it with a grain of salt, but uh, hopefully, hopefully it's relevant. And then specifically around Mesa and, uh, you know, Mesa DRM and, and kind of the standard uh, Linux stack as opposed to not any open driver, right? So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, uh, the, you know, the trade-offs there and, and how uh, positive it's been. Um, so to start, I, I think these are, at, at this point, well understood, right? Uh, game developer or app developer dealing with open source drivers uh, as opposed to closed drivers um, has a little bit more data, right? So if, if, you, if you need to diagnose a crash or performance problems, uh, you know, just by being, uh, dealing with open drivers, you, you just have a little bit of extra visibility into what's going on. Um, so if you hit a crash, uh, you know, you know the, the backtrace is more, uh, more often useful and it's gonna give you uh, some context about uh, what's going on, especially for OpenGL, right? Uh, the API is structured in such a way that most driver crashes are gonna be on GL draw elements or whatever the draw call you use is and trying to trace back to a piece of, trace the crash back to the piece of state that you set, or you know, a, a, certain, a certain feature that you're using can be pretty frustrating uh, if you don't have symbols. Um, 
same with performance issues. You know, if you're hitting a slow path, um, it, just having symbols and source code uh, it was a little bit easier. Um, you can unblock yourself by, you know, stubbing out a piece of code that's causing your crash or, you know, applying a patch that's floating around. Um, it, it's a thing that, you know, we, we like to joke around a little bit, like, yeah, well, driver developers don't grow on trees. You know, like, not every game developer can go debug the driver. It turns out that this does happen in practice. Like, I've seen it happen, uh, especially developers that, you know, deal with Linux a lot. Uh, they, they seem to take that... Uh, they just use the chance when, when they have it, and then it's, it's proven useful in practice. Um, so in general, you know, open drivers, you, you can block yourself in, in more ways. Um, so that, but I think at this point, that's really well understood, and it's, you know, it, it, it's, not, it's not really hard to, uh, to reason around that. But all these things have side effects that at least, uh, I think, benefit the vendor uh, way more than you'd think. Um, so if you're looking at it from the hardware vendor's perspective, right, uh, an app developer trying to bring their game to market and dealing with your driver, uh, it's one of the configurations that they, have to, that they have to support. It's probably not the only one, right? Um, they're most likely on a very tight schedule, uh, especially game developers, right? Uh, and I've been guilty of the same thing. You're you know, trying to ship your game. You hit a crash in one of the configurations that you have to support. Uh, you're going to do whatever's the quickest way to avoid it and move on. And, you know, in your head, you're like, oh, I'll, I'll deal with it later. But really what happens is you never deal with it, and your game ships like that. Uh, most likely, the vendor driver is going to figure out that you hit a crash and had to disable that cool feature that they really wanted you to use after the game shipped. And either they're testing it or they read about it in some kind of postmortem where you mention it as an offhand comment, like, oh, yeah, we had to disable all that. Uh, and it's, it's super, it's sad. Like, whenever that happens, it's really sad. Um, when the open drivers uh, are being used, like, all these things that I was talking about before kind of reduce the likelihood of that happening because the game developer is able to unblock themselves, right? And it's, it's just reducing ever so often a little bit the, the uh, frequency of, of what I'm describing. Um, so I think that it's actually way more beneficial from the hardware vendor's perspective because of these myriad of apps, right, that, uh, that are being targeted against their driver. Um, and actually, a lot of the people targeting apps uh, towards a certain driver don't really have a direct relationship to a certain vendor, uh, you know, vendor driver's team, um, either because what they're working on is under wraps and they can't really, you know, disclose it to outside parties or because they're a smaller developer and they don't have a direct line to you know, whatever is their uh, preferred vendor of choice. Uh, it, you know, there's a lot of, of Leaf app developers out there that are targeting your driver, and you might not even know about them or, you know, not have a direct point of uh, contact with them. Uh, so the, the open driver is, you know, just makes it more likely that they're using your driver and your hardware as a, as a result to its full extent. Um, for triaging, it's actually pretty useful. I've seen uh, a pattern where uh, bugs reported against open drivers are just uh, better quality and have more information up front, uh, meaning that if you're, uh, you know, on the, on the other side of it, at the receiving end of all these bugs, you just have more options, right? You're able to uh, triage the bugs without having to first repro them because uh, you pretty much already know, or at least in a lot of cases, you already know what's, what's happening uh, and what, you know, if it's a crash, if it's a slow path triggered by something. In a lot of cases for, um, for closed drivers, the first step is you have to repro it in-house and you're in the dark before you do that, right? Open drivers kind of uh, change that equation a bit. Uh, and recruiting is, you know, a small bullet point there, but it's actually a giant aspect of it. Uh, if, if you're dealing with an open stack, uh, recruiting is kind of as easy as, uh, you know, finding people that are really, uh, really, how to say that? <laughs> uh, well, it's just easy because you have a lot of people that are motivated to contribute to your driver, and even if most of them, you know, don't, uh, you know, don't really uh, ramp up to be becoming like full contributors that you'd like to have in your team, it does happen in practice. And some of them, uh, you know, will. I mean, you, you basically see candidates that have the right incentive to already work on your driver because they're doing it, right? So it, it's as easy as just reaching out and seeing if they're interested. Um, anyway, so. From a pl platform vendor's perspective, um, the open drivers reduces risk quite a bit, right? Uh, if, you're, if you're looking at hardware, uh, 
any uh, difference in overlap between your own goals as a platform vendor and a hardware vendor is very risky if their driver stack is closed. Um, as, as opposed to you know, dealing with Mesa or you know, other sorts of open source drivers, uh, as a platform vendor, it kind of gives you um, a lot of safety because you're able to kind of steer it in the direction you want, prototype new features, uh, even if they're not fully aligned with the, the vendor uh, of the hardware, right? And so it makes the hardware more useful. Um, and it's just more, that much more likely that you know, someone might you know, want to use your hardware. Um, but more importantly, it's possible that people out there are kind of passing on your hardware without you even knowing about it because uh, you know, your stack is closed and they evaluate it be behind closed doors. You don't have a direct relationship with them, right? And, and uh, they do the determination on, on their end that um, you know, whatever support exists is not really a good fit for what they want to do with their platform and, and they move on, right? Um, I don't know how often that happens in practice, but I suspect it does uh, more often than people think. Um, so something about the Mesa model, I guess, is, is really interesting to me. Uh, and you know, so that's not really just about closed driver uh, as a, you know, in comparison to open drivers, right? Open drivers can mean you know, just a, a piece of code uh, thrown over the wall um, you know, that you have to build yourself and that's not really part of any community processes. M Mesa is quite different, right? Um, it, and it's really fascinating to me because you end up with a driver stack where various drivers from totally different, uh, you know, hardware vendors, uh, desktop, mobile, uh, kind of self-organize and through that community process, you know, make engineering decisions that make sense for them. So you end up with uh, code sharing that happens uh, organically as opposed to, you know, being a single driver model that the platform vendor kind of dictates, right? Uh, that happens on, on some other platforms where uh, the, the platform holder will, uh, you know, create all kinds of uh, middleware and then there's a, a spot where you plug in your driver. Um, Mesa is not like that. Like all, all the instances of, of that happen because uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but because the various driver teams kind of decided that it made sense for them to reuse such a component, uh, be it, you know, in a shader compiler or state trackers. And so you end up with uh, common code paths between drivers that are actually extremely robust, right, because everyone's using them. Um, and we, I mean, we think that's a great uh, cost saver, right? If, if you want to bring, uh, bring up in your harder platform, you have all this infrastructure you can build on top of, uh, which is really nice and reduces the cost of adoption. Um, so another way that people have, you know, reduced uh, cost across uh, different platforms is to reuse a lot of their stack, right? Um, I think it works in practice, and you know, it's a, it's a proven model that's that's being used. Uh, but I'm a little bit worried that as platforms diverge more and different platform holders want to differentiate and you know add add value, uh, that model is going to fall apart a little bit, and you end up with a primary platform that's the well-supported one. And then every other platform, the more code you're trying to reuse, uh, the more of a, you know, a square peg you're trying to f uh, fit into a round hole, right? Like your, your end result is not maybe a great fit for a platform or uh, new, new platform features is not easy as a, uh, to adopt as there would be you know, if you were reusing the common stack that's out there. Um, so maybe the way to go is to uh, share smaller modules instead, right? as opposed to have the whole vertical stack coming along, uh, just share a shader compiler, like a you know, pretty standalone library that happens pretty far in the pipeline, or uh, you know, libs to translate uh, address, you know, address space for like block linear layouts or whatever. Uh, may maybe that's a better model to follow. Um, so it, it's, not all, you know, it's not all magic, you know, like open drivers aren't gonna solve every problem for you. You still need a uh, you know, well-funded driver team that can be reactive to uh, software issues that are coming up, right? There's going to be uh, game developers or app developers uh, making new apps, uh, and you know, behind the scenes that are not in the open yet, right? So you have to be able to support them privately. You have new hardware development. Um, just things shift in such a way that you, you need to have people on hand to be able to react to it. Um, and as probably we'll see in most of that conference, probably gonna be a recurring topic, but uh, QA and testing is still something that requires uh, so much manpower and such an upfront investment that uh, it's pretty, at, at this point, unreasonable to expect the community to kind of uh, field everything for it. 
Um, so I think it's a good fit for vendor drivers to to take the lead on that and and you know keep that um, keep that close uh, even if it's in the open, right? Like uh, I think that the best results there are going to come from well-funded uh, systems that are uh, tied closely to certain drivers uh, driver vendors. Um, yeah, so that's just my general thoughts uh, on on the topic, just from you know dealing with these various use cases over years. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily you know, consider it, uh, uh, you know, targeted towards a certain vendor. I think it's as much as uh, advice for uh, people that are already doing that to keep doing it, uh, people that are kind of halfway through it to maybe consider contributing to Mesa more or moving more of their drivers to the, the Mesa stack. And for people who are not doing it to, you know, maybe it's a good idea to consider it. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre Lou. He's got some great insights and a lot of good ex practical experience here. Um, I wanted to just ask the community while I'm here, you know, if we have a vision where every game engine developer utilizes your driver, and how do we ensure a great gaming experience in that case at scale? Um, what would you need from these devs to ensure that you can fix your driver before the game launches? Uh, and that, that we can make sure that there aren't regressions on all of these thousands of titles in the back catalog. What do engine devs need from an open source driver? Uh, reach, misspelled. Um, <laughs> but uh, the driver adoption on, on the most popular platforms, uh, the reach for the latest driver, uh, it's a big percentage, and to get older hardware, it's a big percentage of their back catalog is, is devices that are two, three, four years old or more. Um, and frankly, timeliness. Being able to get these updates uh, out to the market before their game launches when they're already you know, deep into a development cycle and they're finally getting around to, to testing various platforms, various hardware configurations, and there may be only a few weeks or a few months left before the game launches. So these are big challenges to do at scale. And um, while I'm here this week, I was hoping to hear your perspective on, on what type of things help make that possible from both an engine developer's perspective and yours as a driver developer. These are really tough engineering challenges. How do we balance that? How do we make sure that uh, while we have happy game devs, we also have a healthy community um, happy de driver developers. Um, how do we end up in a situation where we don't have so many regression tests that we can't get through them all? How do we weed out or how do we focus on the ones that are most relevant that will help us find the, the real crux of the problem within a few days? Um, any, any, any real regressions anyway? Uh, how do we capture workloads across GPU architectures? How do we capture engine bugs to improve the validation layer? And uh, how do we capture driver bugs to make sure that the conformance tests get better? These are all things that we do in some level or another today, but how do we do them at scale as we, uh, as we take advantage of this opportunity to make open source drivers more relevant and, and uh, more engaged in a large ecosystem? So we, we do face a lot of challenges today, but we have fundamental advantages in open source and uh, in the community approach that we have here. So thank you for your time, and we look forward to continuing working with you. I think we have time for maybe a few questions, if, if people have any. We have a mic here, so yes. Uh, so what's that you want to? Ask a question. Any question? Uh, this is to Pierre, really. Everything you say intuitively makes sense. Um, is there any data to like back up um, these things? Well. I actually considered, you know, scouring bug trackers and capturing screenshots of these instances happening in the field. Um, 
but it sounded like a lot of work, so I ended up not doing it. Um, sorry. Um, but at, at this point, yeah, there's not really hard data, right? All, all this is just uh, kind of perspective, and it's, it's, not, it's not objective, right? Um, we think it's maybe a, you know, a, a way to consider and, and could be uh, potentially uh, you know, the way to go. Uh, in, in practice, we have, um, you know, if you compare our gaming experience across uh, these different driver stacks, our feature set right now is pretty interchangeable. There's been, you know, some challenges with bringing up, like, the latest and greatest VR features and stuff, but overall, like, we're in good shape across the board, and we do have a pipeline where um, we can effectively support ourselves or, and our game development partners publishing games on our platform, as well as third-party games and use cases on uh, all the relevant hardware, right? Um, so it's not... In, in practice, like, it's not like one side is totally burning and, and one side isn't, right? <laughs> Uh, it's actually, uh, it's actually fine, but we're a little bit privileged in the sense that we have a great relationship with, uh, you know, vendor drivers that are not in the open right now, and so we're able to get the support we need. Uh, this is just one example, right? So it's possible that there's more people out there that are not able to get that support, and it might be a good idea to uh, consider to consider them. Uh, and, and see, you know, how moving into a more open direction might uh, benefit, um, you know, the, the long tail of developers out there that are not necessarily in the same position we are. Hey guys, um, so I, I just had a couple comments about one of your one of your earlier slides. I think the probably the best thing that game developers can do to sort of help help us help them is when they get to, to stuck points is not spend too long being stuck and actually just come to us and say, hey, we're, we're having this problem, WTF. And on the one hand, that's actually kind of hard because they're like everyone else. They're super busy and being crushed by deadlines and everything else. And also, it's kind of weird because they're used to dealing with people in ivory towers that you can never approach and can never contact. But, you know, we're just regular schmucks that you can walk up to on the street. <laughs> um, and then the other thing about uh, testing and reporting bugs, I think over the last 10 years, the thing that I've found most helpful is actually when game developers report non-conformance issues in drivers up through the API creation mechanism. They report it up through Kronos so that then, um, conformance can get uh, enforced there so that you don't end up with as much of the situation where vendor B is trying to chase the behavior of vendor A that every game dev happens to be depending on and didn't know they were depending on. And that's been a huge source of chasing our tail over, over the last 10 years. And not, and not just for us in the open source, it was Worse for us because we came along a lot later on most of the APIs, but I know everyone else has had to do that a lot too. Yeah, thanks, Ian. That's, those are both good points. I, I will add on the second point, um, it is much improved in terms of the process that Kronos has for improving the validation layers, the conformance tests. What I'm seeing is there's still a gap between um, the failures and, and um, and those getting to Bugzilla, going into those organizations in a way that um, really bridges that gap effectively. Sometimes it's, um, I think it's a there's, a, there's a lot of cases where people think there's a driver failure. Um, it's actually it needs to be, a, it's an engine failure that needs a validation case. By the time these get figured out and worked out, um, or the complexity of the workloads, it, it's hard to isolate for that particular case. Um, so I, I think there's still some um, improvements we need as we as we get to scale, but um, it's it's better than it has been, and uh, um, and as, as we figure out how to bridge that kind of middle gap, that the, the pr you're absolutely right. The process at Kronos is working much better. So thanks for that input. Got another question there. I have a question uh, which is related to the recent. Uh, person working in Valve, 
and he is related to the reset enablement uh, in a, a beta program uh, for using wine uh, to be able, uh, let's say, to run, uh, uh, say, Windows games on top uh, of the uh, Linux stack. My, my question is, uh, um, basically, uh, what may happen now? So, because in principle, um, these uh, uh, stacks uh, seems to be working very well. So I test, try myself some games, and they work even if uh, the beta program is not extended, let's say, to the full set of games. But in the end, the question is, what will happen to the <coughs> Linux, uh, uh, let's say, development uh, in games? Uh, sorry, can you try being a little louder? Sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble making it out. Uh, sorry, so I, I will synthesize the question. So I think this uh, uh, layer for translating, uh, so you can run Windows games on Linux Wine, and uh, with, uh, let's say the Vulkan translation. <coughs> Sorry, I have a little bit low voice. So the question is, uh, what, what will happen, let's say, to Linux uh, de development games uh, in Valve in the next uh, uh, future? Um, so it's not necessarily what we were talking about here, but um, I, I think that in the long run, you know, more people playing games on Linux means that more games are going to be made on Linux, and that's a good thing. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Jacob. Hello, Jens. <laughs> nice to see you again. Um, so there's two things. So on the timeliness, uh, I think, I don't know how many distribution people are here, but when I did try development and try to get things out. That was where the pain point was. So uh, I don't know how we should improve that situation. Uh, it was very much timing, making sure that the change went into Mesa at that point, and then Mesa went out before the release was made. So or poking people to uh, get our patches in. So um, I don't know what kind of. So, we can, improve there. can I rephrase it? Are you you're referring to um, updates through Mesa releases, then ultimately through a distro, and the time it takes to get an updated driver out to the end users? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I, I think that process is it's difficult, right? It, there's it, there's a lot of steps involved with that, and and um, what what I've seen is that uh, we can't always wait for. We can't take the time like to get the latest um, unstable branch stable uh, and get all the latest features out. As for, from a timeliness perspective um, or momentum before launch, working within a stable branch is, is a critical aspect to, to speeding up the process. Um, but I think we're we're seeing good examples of this at, at Google anyway, where. Um, We'll have, like if you, if you look at uh, the open source support for Chrome OS, there's, uh, there's definitely a, um, a larger driver team in the community doing the work there, but we also have a, a stable branch for that specific product or for specific Chromebooks. And getting those patches out in a timely fashion and then waiting for, and of course putting them upstream as well and then waiting for that to, to come out in, a, in, a, in the more typical process is just fine too. So I, I think there are, there are alternatives, and we definitely want to want to see um, everything get upstreamed and, and everything come together in a, in a good way. But there may be times when we have to push stuff onto a, a more stable maintenance branch just for for timeliness. Okay. Yeah. Um, and also uh, making Linux a better platform. I think there's a lot of tools that could written and then or try by written or whatever, uh, where people do something cool and then they have to do something else or they lose interest and stuff. There's, there's no continuing, continue, uh, there's no, no, no long, long, long running thread through all the tools that have written. written. So, uh, yeah, so I think we need to make something or get better at doing things for longer, especially when it comes to debugging tools. And I've been guilty of it as well where I just wrote a tool and then 
dumped it out there and nothing really happened more, so. Um, yeah. I mean, in, in general, I'll add that um, having users um, access newer drivers than what is typically uh, shipped by default on their distribution has been one of the number one challenges with uh, shipping kind of advanced, you know, gaming uh, apps on Linux desktops. Over five years, uh, I've been working on that problem. And I think that, you know, it's something that's getting better. We've been engaging with major distros to provide uh, fresher drivers through, you know, built-in repositories that are easy to access. But it's still, it's still a challenge even now. Um, so I guess it's another advantage that I would kind of put in the open drivers court where people actually have the option of shipping updated client drivers in their own runtime uh, in the Mesa model, which is uh, maybe something we'll start taking advantage of in the future where, you know, Steam might come with its own version of Mesa, um, which is made possible by, you know, the, the, version, the versioning of interfaces, you know, between uh, the DRM interfaces and the kernel interfaces and uh, the, the client, the user space side of it. Um, so, and, and you see the same thing happening in, uh, you know, these new runtime app models that are being uh, specced and worked on right now. Things like Flatpak. Uh, a Flatpak runtime can include, you know, its own user space graphics stack as well. So I, I, maybe that's one direction to go uh, to make sure that the client application always has access to the feature set it needs uh, and that it's been well uh, validated uh, with. Of course, it, it's not a great you know, it's not the solution to it at all. Like every app shipping with its own driver stack would be a nightmare, right? Um, I'm just saying that maybe there's a middle ground that make, might make the user experience, the end user experience better. Hi there. <clears throat> so you spoke a lot of, uh, of good points on the subject of um, working with hardware vendors to unify on open drivers like Mesa. I wanted to hear some of your thoughts on any similar principles we can apply to working with operating system vendors for other operating systems to push back on things like uh, Apple's Metal initiative and try to steer game developers and driver developers towards using the open stack like OpenGL and Vulkan instead. Um, well, the, I think the implementation of this stack is a pretty different topic than the standards themselves, right? Uh, and I was more focused on the implementation side of things. Uh, but the topic of getting uh, the game industry in general to converge on open standards, right, is a, is a big one. Uh, it's something that uh, I've personally been working hard on for more than four years at this point. Uh, and, you know, uh, things like making Vulkan supported on Mac through an open source uh, Vulkan to metal layer is one of the things that we've done along these lines. We're also, you know, talking to a lot of devs and I can guarantee you that uh, every, day, every dev that, you know, give, gets within my earshot uh, is, is talked to about Vulkan and its benefits. <laughs> uh, it's not necessarily uh, successful, right? There's a lot of inertia with development processes and tools on other platforms. People are, um, I mean, game developers are beasts of habit, right? They have Visual Studio, they have their dev kits, they have their workflow. Uh, they do that from project to project. It's really risky for them to completely switch technologies, but I think that the industry is headed in the right direction there. So I'm, I'm pretty hopeful for the future. I'll, I'll add that um, I think the best thing we can do is to continue to make the progress we've been doing. Pierre Lou talked about the the Vulkan support, I mean, I think just Vulkan in general, having a good API for, for game developers has been a huge enabling step. Um, but as we get more and more of our ducks in a row on the open stack, that just puts competitive pressure on, on players that aren't, aren't involved with it. So uh, let's just continue making it great. Any other question? All right, thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks.